The Book of Job Commentary by A. F. Ausset. Introduction. Job a real person. It has been supposed by some that the Book of Job is an allegory, not a real narrative, on account of the artificial character of many of its statements. Thus the sacred numbers, three and seven, often occurred. He had seven thousand sheep, seven sons, both before and after his trials, his three friends sit down with him seven days and seven nights, both before and after his trials he had three daughters. So also the number and form of the speeches of the several speakers seem to be artificial. The name of Job, too, is derived from an Arabic word signifying repentance. But Ezekiel 14, 14, compare Ezekiel 14, 16, 20, speaks of Job in conjunction with Noah and Daniel, real persons. Saint James, James 5, 11, also refers to Job as an example of patience, which he would not have been likely to do had Job been only a fictitious person. Also the names of persons and places are specified with a particularity not to be looked for in an allegory. As to the exact doubling of his possessions after his restoration, no doubt the round number is given for the exact number, as the latter approached near the former, this is often done in undoubtedly historical books. As to the studied number and form of the speeches, it seems likely that the arguments were substantially those which appear in the book, but that the studied and poetic form was given by Job himself, guided by the Holy Spirit. He lived 140 years after his trials, and nothing would be more natural than that he should, at his leisure, mold into a perfect form the arguments used in the momentous debate, for the instruction of the church in all ages. Probably, too, the debate itself occupied several sittings, and the number of speeches assigned to each was arranged by preconcerted agreement, and each was allowed the interval of a day or more to prepare carefully his speech and replies. This will account for the speakers bringing forward their arguments in regular series, no one speaking out of his turn. As to the name Job, repentance, supposing the derivation correct, it was common in old times to give a name from circumstances which occurred at an advanced period of life, and this is no argument against the reality of the person. Where Job lived. Use, according to Jesnius, means a light, sandy soil and was in the north of Arabia deserta, between Palestine and the Euphrates, called by Ptolemy, Geography, 19, Ozitai or Aitai. In Genesis 10, 23, 22, 21, 36, 28, and 1 Chronicles 1, 17, 42, it is the name of a man. In Jeremiah 25, 20, Lamentations 4, 21, and Job 1, 1. It is a country. Use, in Genesis 22, 21, is said to be the son of Nahar, brother of Abraham, a different person from the one mentioned, Genesis 10, 23, a grandson of Shem. The probability is that the country took its name from the latter of the two, for this one was the son of Aram, from whom the Arameans take their name, and these dwelt in Mesopotamia, between the rivers Euphrates and Tigris compare as to the dwelling of the sons of Shem in Genesis 10, 30, amount of the east, answering to men of the east, Job 1, 3. Rawlinson, in his deciphering of the Assyrian inscriptions, states that use is the prevailing name of the country at the mouth of the Euphrates. It is probable that Aleph as the Temanite and the Sabines dwelt in that quarter, and we know that the Chaldeans resided there, and not near Idumea which some identify with use. The tornado from the wilderness, Job 1, 19, agrees with the view of it being Arabia deserta. Job, Job 1, 3, is called the greatest of the men of the east, but Idumea was not east, but south of Palestine, therefore in scripture language, the phrase cannot apply to that country, but probably refers to the north of Arabia deserta, between Palestine, Idumea, and the Euphrates. So the Arabs still show in the hour in a place called Uz as the residence of Job. The age when Job lived. Eusebius fixes it two ages before Moses, that is, about the time of Isaac, 1800 years before Christ, and 600 after the deluge. 
Agreeing with this are the following considerations, 1. Job's length of life is patriarchal, 200 years. 2. He alludes only to the earliest form of idolatry, namely, the worship of the sun, moon, and heavenly hosts, called Saba, whence arises the title Lord of Sabath, as opposed to Sabianism, Job 31, 26-28. 3. The number of oxen and rams sacrificed, 7, as in the case of Balaam. God would not have sanctioned this after the giving of the Mosaic law, though he might graciously accommodate himself to existing customs before the law. 4. The language of Job is Hebrew, interspersed occasionally with Syriac and Arabic expressions, implying a time when all the Shemitic tribes spoke one common tongue and had not branched into different dialects, Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic. 5. He speaks of the most ancient kind of writing, namely, sculpture. Riches also are reckoned by cattle. The Hebrew word, translated a piece of money, ought rather be rendered a lamb. 6. There is no allusion to the exodus from Egypt and to the miracles that accompanied it, nor to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Patrick, however, thinks there is, though there is to the flood, Job 22, 17, and these events, happening in Job's vicinity, would have been striking illustrations of the argument for God's interposition in destroying the wicked and vindicating the righteous, had Job and his friends known of them. Nor is there any undoubted reference to the Jewish law, ritual, and priesthood. 7. The religion of Job is that which prevailed among the patriarchs previous to the law, sacrifices performed by the head of the family, no officiating priesthood, temple, or consecrated altar. The writer. All the foregoing facts accord with Job himself having been the author. The style of thought, imagery, and manners are such as we should look for in the work of an Arabian emir. There is precisely that degree of knowledge of primitive tradition, see Job 31, 33, as to Adam, which was universally spread abroad in the days of Noah and Abraham, and which was subsequently embodied in the early chapters of Genesis. Job, in his speeches, shows that he was much more competent to compose the work than Elihu, to whom Lightfoot attributes it. The style forbids its being attributed to Moses, to whom its composition is by some attributed, whilst he was among the Midianites, about 1520 b.100. But the fact, that it, though not a Jewish book, appears among the Hebrew sacred writings, makes it likely that it came to the knowledge of Moses during the forty years which he passed in parts of Arabia, chiefly near Horeb, and that he, by divine guidance, introduced it as a sacred writing to the Israelites, to whom, in their affliction, the patience and restoration of Job were calculated to be a lesson of especial utility. That it is inspired appears from the fact that Paul, 1 Corinthians 3, 19, quotes it, Job 5, 13, with the formula, it is written, Our Saviour, 2 Matthew 24, 28 plainly refers to Job 29, 30. Compare also James 4, 10 and 1 Peter 5, 6 with Job 22, 29, Romans 11, 34, 35 with Job 15, 8. It is probably the oldest book in the world. It stands among the hagiographa in the threefold division of scripture into the law, the prophets, and the hagiographa, Psalms, Luke 24, 44. Design of the book. It is a public debate in poetic form on an important question concerning the divine government, moreover the prologue and epilogue, which are in prose, shed the interest of a living history over the debate, which would otherwise be but a contest of abstract reasonings. To each speaker of the three friends three speeches are assigned. Job having no one to stand by him is allowed to reply to each speech of each of the three. Eliphaz, as the oldest, leads the way. Zophar, at his third turn, failed to speak, thus virtually owning himself overcome, Job 27, 1-23. Therefore Job continued his reply, which forms three speeches, Job 26, 1-14, 27, 1-23, 28, 1-28.
29, 1-31, 40. Elihu, Job 32, 1-37, 24, is allowed four speeches. Jehovah makes three addresses, Job 38, 1-41, 34. Thus, throughout there is a tripartite division. The whole is divided into three parts, the prologue, poem proper, and epilogue. The poem, into three, one, the dispute of Job and his three friends, two, the address of Elihu, three, the address of God. There are three series in the controversy, and in the same order. The epilogue, Job 42, 1 to 17, also is threefold, Job's justification, reconciliation with his friends, restoration. The speakers also in their successive speeches regularly advance from less to greater vehemence. With all this artificial composition, everything seems easy and natural. The question to be solved, as exemplified in the case of Job, is, why are the righteous afflicted consistently with God's justice? The doctrine of retribution after death, no doubt, is the great solution of the difficulty. And to it Job plainly refers in Job 14, 14, and Job 19, 25. The objection to this, that the explicitness of the language on the resurrection in Job is inconsistent with the obscurity on the subject in the early books of the Old Testament, is answered by the fact that Job enjoyed the divine vision, Job 38, 1, 42, 5, and therefore, by inspiration, foretold these truths. Next, the revelations made outside of Israel being few needed to be the more explicit, thus Balaam's prophecy, Numbers 24, 17, was clear enough to lead the wise men of the east by the star, Matthew 2, 2, and in the age before the written law, it was the more needful for God not to leave himself without witness of the truth. Still Job evidently did not fully realize the significance designed by the Spirit in his own words, compare 1 Peter 1, 11, 12. The doctrine, though existing, was not plainly revealed or at least understood. Hence he does not mainly refer to this solution. Yes, and even now, we need something in addition to this solution. David, who firmly believed in a future retribution, Psalms 16, 10, 17, 15, still felt the difficulty not entirely solved thereby, Psalms 83, 1-18. The solution is not in Job's or in his three friends' speeches. It must, therefore, be in Elihu's. God will hold a final judgment, no doubt, to clear up all that seems dark in his present dealings, but he also now providentially and morally governs the world and all the events of human life. Even the comparatively righteous are not without sin which needs to be corrected. The justice and love of God administer the altogether deserved and merciful correction. Affliction to the godly is thus mercy and justice in disguise. The afflicted believer on repentance sees this. Via crucis, via salatis, the way of the cross, the way of deliverance. Though afflicted, the godly are happier or even now than the ungodly, and when affliction has attained its end, it is removed by the Lord. In the Old Testament the consolations are more temporal and outward, in the New Testament, more spiritual, but in neither to the entire exclusion of the other. Prosperity says Bacon, is the blessing of the Old Testament, adversity that of the New Testament, which is the mark of God's more especial favor. Yet even in the Old Testament, if you listen to David's harp, you shall hear as many hearse, like airs as carols, and the pencil of the Holy Ghost has labored more in describing the afflictions of Job than the felicities of Solomon. Prosperity is not without many fears and distastes, and adversity is not without comforts and hopes. This solution of Elahu is seconded by the addresses of God, in which it is shown God must be just, because he is God, as Elahu had shown how God can be just, and yet the righteous be afflicted. It is also acquiesced in by Job, who makes no reply. God reprimands the three friends, but not Elahu. Job's general course is approved, he is directed to intercede for his friends, and is restored to double his former prosperity. Poetry. In all countries poetry is the earliest form of composition as being best retained in the memory. 
In the East especially it was customary for sentiments to be preserved in a terse, proverbial, and poetic form, called mashkal. Hebrew poetry is not constituted by the rhythm or meter, but in a form peculiar to itself, one. In an alphabetical arrangement somewhat like our acrostic. For instance, Lamentations 1, 1 to 22, 2. The same verse repeated at intervals, as in Psalms 42, 1 to 11, 107, 1 to 43. 3. Rhythm of gradation. Psalms of degrees, Psalms 120, 1 to 134, 3, in which the expression of the previous verse is resumed and carried forward in the next, Psalms 121, 1 to 8. 4. The chief characteristic of Hebrew poetry is parallelism, or the correspondence of the same ideas in the parallel clauses. The earliest instance is Enoch's prophecy, Jude 14, and Lamech's parody of it, Genesis 4, 23. Three kinds occur, 1, the synonymous parallelism, in which the second is a repartition of the first, with or without increase of force, Psalms 22, 27, Isaiah 15, 1, sometimes with double parallelism, Isaiah 1, 15. 2, the antithetic, in which the idea of the second clause is the converse of that in the first, Proverbs 10, 1. 3, the synthetic, where there is a correspondence between different propositions, noun answering to noun, verb to verb, member to member, the sentiment, moreover, being not merely echoed, or put in contrast but enforced by accessory ideas, Job 3, 3 3-9. Also alternate, Isaiah 51, 19. Desolation and destruction, famine and sword, that is, desolation by famine, and destruction by the sword. Introverted, where the fourth answers to the first, and the third to the second, Matthew 7, 6. Parallelism thus often affords a key to the interpretation. For fuller information, see Loth, Introduction to Isaiah, and Lecture on Hebrew Poetry, and Herder, Spirit of Hebrew Poetry, translated by Marsh. The simpler and less artificial forms of parallelism prevail in Job, a mark of its early age, and prevail in Job, a mark of its early